do you want to wed a practical compliance education in a law school setting? Do you want to learn from hands-on compliance practitioners about the ins and outs of doing compliance in an organization at law school? Then South Texas College of Law is for you. In this episode, I visit with Dean Cherie Taylor from the South Texas College of Law, Houston, about the exciting new compliance certification she's working on. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. Welcome to a Another episode, and today I have with me Dean Cherie Taylor from the South Texas College of Law. Uh, Dean Taylor uh, was one of the people who were driving a really interesting new initiative uh, to bring corporate compliance into a law school curriculum. So, Dean Taylor, first of all, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. It's a great pleasure to join you. Thank you for asking me. Dean Taylor, I wonder if you might start off by talking a little bit about your professional background and then your move into academia. Um, my professional background was I was that person that wanted to be a lawyer at 10 years old. And then somewhere along the way, probably about 13, I decided that international was interesting to me. Uh, so I actually went to law school hoping to be an international lawyer with, by the way, no idea what that meant. Um And law school at the University of Georgia, which is where I went to law school at the time, was great in the public international law area. But what I fell in love with in law school by working on my journal was international trade and business. Um, And at the time, law schools weren't really teaching that in the early 80s because America still wasn't exporting and we weren't really leading the front in, in that sort of move. Now, right after that, sort of my entire career was the opposite of that. So so my interest peaked on exactly the right area at exactly the right time is the way I see it. Um, so my background is undergrad, um, Harvard, um, law school at Georgia, an LLM at Georgetown that I got while I was practicing um, in Washington. Uh, after I got out of law school, I clerked for a, a judge on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And then I went to Steptoe and Johnson in Washington, where I was an associate for five years. Um, I worked in the antitrust and international trade group, and I was really in the trade group. So at the time, it would have been pre-WTO. I worked on matters that went to GATT dispute settlement at the time. Uh, we did a lot of work advising governments and clients on trade legislation at the time, which was a very big deal in the early 80s. Um, I worked on the first guide to the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement um, and things like that. So, so a lot of work on supporting research and analysis for trade actions, anti-dumping, countervailing duty actions, trade legislation, trade policy. So that, so I think of myself still to this day as a trade lawyer, um, but also some transactional work largely in the area of export controls. So that was pretty much my practice. I haven't heard anyone say GATT in a long time. I remember that I from know. law school. I know. So, um, it dates me, so right? So tell us about your move to academia. Um, How did you get to South Texas College of Law? How did I get to South Texas? I was I, I actually loved working on the matters that I worked on at my law firm. I found the matters to be just absolutely fascinating. But what I realized was I really wanted to spend the time researching and thinking about these fields. And I was honest with myself about how does one get paid to actually research and think deeply <laughs> in a field? And academia seemed like the logical solution. So I did what almost all young people do when they want to join the legal profession. They um They apply to the American Association of Law Schools and they put themselves in the rotation for the annual meeting to hire. And in the last year that I was in Washington, I finished my five years at the firm and then I finished my LLM. I was writing my 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 actual finishing piece, dissertation piece from my LLM degree that year. And I applied for teaching jobs. So I put myself into that rotation and schools called me up and interviewed me. And the reason I was really drawn to South Texas is because South Texas was at that moment realizing that they did not have a program in what we now call international economic law. At the time, there wasn't even a name for the field, Uh, but they knew that they wanted private international law teaching, international business, trade, um, because Houston is a globe city, because we're a port city, because of the high amount of transactional work done in the city. So the goal was to just have someone come in and build that curriculum. And I I can't tell you how exciting that was as a young person being interviewed for such a position because I thought, can I build a curriculum? Absolutely. (laughs) Set me loose. Um, So that's what the school gave to me. And also I was attracted because this was a big city. Um, And 
trade and transactional workflows out of big urban cities. So could you tell us about some of the roles you've held at South Texas College of Law and some of the uh, various classes that you've taught over the years? Sure. Um, I started off, as all young professors do, where you teach one course that you teach for the school because it has to be taught all the time, and I teach civil procedure. So every lawyer that that listens to this knows what that means, and I've been a civil procedure teacher for 31 years. Um, But everything else I teach is an upper-level elective. So I started with international business transactions, and over the years I've taught international civil litigation. I developed a really in-depth and very interesting course on NAFTA trade and transactions, I teach a pure trade law course that I call World Trading Systems that actually focuses not just on WTO rules, but also on regional agreements, on free trade agreements and things like that. Um, I have taught in the past European Union law. Um, And what I've really added in the last 15 years is a concentration on my participation in the transactional skills area of the school because we have a strong program in that area. And I built with a practitioner, um, an IP practitioner, we built a course um, in transactional skills that teaches a small group of students how to draft transactional documents. So we start with about 15 people and they have to draft a complete transactional document, either a joint venture agreement, um, a IP license agreement, or a distribution of goods, international distribution of goods deal. Um, And they work in a team You know, the team is doing this whole deal for a hypothetical transaction, and the whole course consists of learning how to draft it, getting critique, and your final product being the completed product after you get the critique um, from the instructors. So I've been, I taught that course, taught, co taught it with Irene Kostarakis of BMC Software for 13 years uh, before I ventured out into doing it on my own. Uh, That was a heavy lift for an adjunct because of all the hours of doing document reviews, and it's easier for a full-time academic to do. Um, So those are the courses that I've taught. So I've gotten more and more involved, not just in international business and trade, but also in transactional work over my time at the school. Um, Became a full-time professor in 97 and the associate dean for academics in 2020. So that's a brand new job for me. So I'd now like to turn to uh, the compliance initiative and uh, walk us through how that, that came to your attention and your your role in that. I know you had a lot of help, and certainly uh, I was part of that. Uh, but it to me was a fascinating exercise and a great new addition to the South Texas College of Law. So let's explore that a little bit. Um. It's it's a great story. I one of the things I set up at the school was an institute for international legal practice and national security. And I have another colleague that handles the national security part of it. But the international legal practice part of it, in my mind, was a merging of international economic law and transactional skills. And in the course of teaching, particularly my normal international business transaction course and my transactional skills course, I became more and more convinced that. Of course, you have to teach students how to draft a ethical business practices clause that involves dealing with the anti-corruption issues. But they really need to understand how, you know, those clauses have developed and how they're rooted in a compliance program. And so the more I read into the field, the more interesting I got, the more interested I got in the field. I knew a former student of mine had actually made a career in this field, and I was following her career, as we do for people that we know have done things. And I contacted her um, and said, can I just ask for a modest thing? Could you help me put together a conference for our journal? Because we have a journal of international economic law at the law school. Um, And Natalia Shahada said to me, oh, conference? No problem. We can do a conference. Here's what we're interested in. Right. And then she proceeded to tell me that what she really wanted was for us to do courses and a certificate program. And, you know, go from there, just to just if we could have our dream of what we would do with the area of compliance, you know, what could we do at the school? And it's the only moment in my life, honestly, professionally, where I've ever thought this is what synergy feels like. I had been wondering about that myself, but thought that was too big an ask to ask for someone. And she brought it back to me in the other direction. So it started there. And then. It's really Natalia Shahada's network of of working in the field for so long and knowing so many excellent people. She brought the people to me. I cannot say that I did any of that. But what I did do was be the interface between the group that really committed itself to this process and the law school. 
because I know about how law schools operate. So our first mission was to do that conference, which we did in April of 2019. And then our next mission was to come up with three syllabi, which we did last summer for initial core courses in what I fully intend to be a certificate program here at the law school. So let me give you my views on that sitting from the outside. I remember that conference. Uh, I was out of town speaking at another conference, so I couldn't attend uh, the one that Talia helped put together. And it came back to me, not from Italia, but from someone else who attended that conference. Hey, Tom, they're thinking about having a compliance initiative over at South Texas. What do you think about that? And I said, God, that's great. Do you know how much work that's going to be? Uh, or does she know how much work that's going to be? I guess is what I said. Uh, but then moving to let's move into the summer of 2020 because she put out this clarion call to the Houston compliance community and uh Houston, for better or worse, is the FCPA epicenter of the world. There have been more Houston-based companies who've gone through FCPA enforcement actions than any other city on earth, and that's because of energy. But what that has done is a couple of things. One is there's an incredibly robust compliance bar in Houston, largely in-house, some in private practice. And we've been doing anti-corruption compliance in Houston since the early 2000s. And so Natalia sends this call out to myself and a lot of our colleagues here in Houston and says, this is what I'm thinking about doing. These are the general areas I'm thinking about doing them in. And she gets us, I will say, and she presents us to you. Could you pick it up there as to what you saw her doing with people like myself and and my colleagues in Houston? Well, I saw her doing the only thing that I think you could possibly do if you want to do this well, which is base the academic program around what the career path is for a compliance attorney. One of the things this school has always focused on is trying to create practice ready attorneys. It's part of the mission of the school. Um, It's one of the reasons I was drawn to the school. It's one of the reasons I was drawn to the transactional skills program, which is clearly that in the other area of corporate work. And I see compliance as an affiliated part of our approach to corporate um, skills training at the school, essentially. And you can't do it without this group of people. There is no way I, as a professor, even with my interest in anti-corruption, and I've been interested in it for years, could have put together the kind of syllabi that practitioners put together. And I knew that. And I think my original discussion with everybody on Zoom meetings, because this was the middle of the COVID crisis, was I'm not going to dictate content to you. You're the drivers of content. What I'm going to do is help you put together a syllabi that meets the modern standards for law school courses um, that will sail through our curriculum committee and our normal process so that we can get these things on our you know, schedules and start teaching them and start building them out. So that was my role. I see my role as really a facilitator to bring the practitioner knowledge and information and experience into the classroom. So she created three or four working groups, of which I was a part of a couple. We had a compliance working group. We had a more legal-focused FCPA or Foreign Corrupt Practices Act group. We had an export control group and I think one other. Uh, We put together these syllabus syllabi and submitted them to you. What was your role after we, during the submission process and thereafter? My role is just to make sure that actually the syllabi sort of met the modern standards for legal education. So nowadays, when you write a syllabus, you have learning outcomes for what the students can expect to learn during the course. Um, There's a great deal of stress put on formative assessments, which means assessments you do during uh, a course process so that students learn about Am I actually learning the material? Am I actually producing materials that show that I understand the concepts and what we're trying to develop? And so it was my goal to sort of give that sort of information. But all along, I was thinking these are going to be these first three courses are going to be our core courses for what would be a certificate program that I very much hope will be modeled after our transactional practice certificate program here at the school. So I do have a model in mind, um, and my goal was just to get them before our curriculum committee. And we have a standard process that I think all law schools do, where you write up a proposal, a syllabi that that is part of a proposal, 
And the proposal is for usually at most law schools and at mine for an experimental course. So the first time something is offered, it's an experiment. And then part of the normal process is that you then report back on that experiment. And then it's in that report back process where the committee talks with the promulgators and the instructors about how it went and what the evaluations say and and what role this plays in the school's plans for the curriculum going forward, that they then approve it as a permanent addition to the curriculum. So we're at the very beginning stages of that now here at the school. We'll be right back with Dean Taylor after a few words from our sponsor. Look, 2020 has proven to be the year of many things, and the same for 2022. But if you're a small business, this could also be the year you switch to a better payroll. Gusto wasn't just built for small businesses, it was built for the people behind them. Their online payroll is easy to use. Gusto can automatically calculate paychecks and file all your payroll taxes, which means you have more time to run your business. Plus, Gusto does way more than payroll. Gusto helps with time tracking, health insurance, 401ks, onboarding, commuter benefits, offer letters, access to HR experts. You get the idea. It's super easy to set up and get started. If you're moving from another provider, they can transfer all your data for you. It's no surprise that 94% of customers are likely to recommend Gusto. And here's the best part. Because you're a listener to this podcast, you get three months totally free. All you have to do is go to gusto.com backslash compliance. That's gusto.com backslash compliance. I'm telling you, you're going to love Gusto. Get started today. I have now known you for a little over a year. Uh, unfortunately, that time we've never met. We've had multiple Zoom calls. Uh, and one thing I think is a fair assessment of you is you're incredibly passionate about this. Did that passion exist with your colleagues on the curriculum committee and really throughout the faculty at South Texas? I think that probably everyone that knows me at the school would say that there's two things about me that they always recognize, which is energy and enthusiasm. Um, I particularly have it for this area. I, I can think of nothing I love more than trade law. That still remains my scholarly area of interest, and I still write in that field. Um, but I've become equally passionate about transactional skills um, and drafting and teaching students how to really draft. And I see compliance as just that next necessary step to what a whole different group of lawyers do for the corporate world. And to me, I audited um, Tom Fox's course, by the way, the first course, the International Corporate Compliance course that we offered in the spring. Um, and I just found it revelatory. There were things about what compliance attorneys, chief compliance attorneys did in that course that really taught me so much about the operation of a corporation that I, as a person who's always worked in trade and business, when I was a lawyer, I had only corporate clients, still did not quite understand about how corporations work. I learned real insights into that. Um, so I think that comes naturally. And I think the curriculum committee kind of always expects me to sort of say, do you see what the vision is for where we're going here? Because I was chair of that committee for basically 20 years here at the school. So they're used to me. They're used to my saying, but we need to have a vision about where we're going next. So they were actually very impressed and thrilled. I can't tell you about the positive response of the committee to all three of the courses. All three of the proposals were so well designed, so are articulate about their approach, about what they were hoping to cover. It, they were not hard calls for the committee. So the committee approves it. And the next step is uh, we have to sell it to the students or you have to sell it to the students. Can you tell us about that process? Never having really had a course focus on this before and how were you able to communicate to the students how this could really fill out a niche in their uh, corporate uh, legal training? That we did last October, and it was incredibly fun. What we did during COVID, again, was we did a series of Zoom calls with what ultimately amounted to about 30 to 40 students sometimes on each call. Uh, we sent out a clarion call again to the to the students. We have great ways of communicating um, to our students constantly. We have an updated thing where we send them, we blast messages and send them things. 
And I sent out a great clearing call for a couple of weeks in advance saying we're doing this new initiative and we were launching these new courses and they were going to get the great gift of having attorneys that worked in the field come and explain what is corporate compliance and what do lawyers actually do and why did you actually choose it as a career? So of the group that put together the syllabi, they came and they spent their time on Zoom calls educating and we did three of them, one around each of the courses um, and the numbers were good from the beginning, but they grew. Um, and the students, many of the students came back for each one of the three, which was really touching. Um, and some of those students, by the way, were first students in the very first course and have signed up again for the second course already. So we're already starting to build a reputation inside the school, which is always the best way uh, to develop anything is when you get good ground press um in the student body and they start to hear about it and they go oh this is cool you know they're doing this do you have you heard about this also because we have an excellent video <laughs> department at the school we can put all these things on our um streaming media server and we had many many students go and actually watch the presentations later because i sent out follow-up messages about this um and so people are still watching those and those discussions were fabulous because the students appeared and they really asked a lot of questions of the attorneys of how did you get into this? Why? And they brought that same kind of passion to the table and the students felt it. And interestingly enough, some of those students also had backgrounds themselves um, in a business career in compliance areas, not as lawyers, but but having worked on the business side connected to it. So that was very interesting to them. So we had our first class in the, uh, I would call it the winter spring semester of 2021. What do you have on tap for the fall semester of this year and going forward into uh, the winter spring semester of uh, 2022? Well, my plan is to keep all three of the core courses on regular rotation here at the school. So in the fall, we're going to do the second course. The first course was International Corporate Compliance, and that was with Tom Fox and Ryan Rabelais in in. The fall, we're going to do the global anti-corruption course, um, and I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be led by Margaret Musadakis and Doug Cohen, um, and I love this team teaching approach because as someone that did that for over 10 years in a transactional skills course, the additional voice in the classroom, I think, is really positive. So I'm very, very excited about that course, and we've got a really good number of students, including some that were that are following from one course to the other um, that are taking the second course, which is a great thing. Um, and then in the spring, we're going to do the international trade compliance course. And that one I am hoping to co-teach uh, because that is, like I said, every time I say the word trade, I just cheer up. Um, so I can't wait to you know get my hands on that and help with that course because that that strikes a personal note for me, um, but never through the compliance lens. So I will bring what I can to it, but I will probably learn more than I actually bring to that course, but I'm very excited for that one in the spring. So that's our first rotation. And then we're just, my goal is to keep all three of those in rotation and this year to also begin developing the certificate program. And tell us a little bit about the certificate program. Well, I really do have a model that I want to use for a certificate program because we have one here at the School for Transactional Skills. And what that means is you take a certain number of core courses, um, you write whatever your graduating paper is, and, and all schools have graduating papers, and we do too, in the area connected to it. So, so a student would write in the area of, of international corporate compliance. Um, you take a certain number of affiliated courses. So you must take the core courses, then you must take a certain number of affiliated courses. You must write in the area. Um, the way I think the, the international corporate compliance one could be a little bit different than the transactional one is that we could do some things that would be um, pushing the boundaries. For example, I'd love to see a skills course come out of the corporate compliance area designed by, by practitioners, not by me, uh, by people that actually know what those skills would be. Uh, but I would love a skills course. Um, I would like some sort of compliance advocacy course because that is a great tradition at my school, um, the traditional trial advocacy, but also the alternative dispute resolution. We have a center that focuses on that. I'd like to expand that as, as a potential opening. And what I'm really waiting for is the day that we figure out how to launch an externship program that would be part of and key to the certificate program. So to me, I have a big vision <laughs> for how I see this moving forward, but those would be components of it. 
Well, Dean Taylor, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted any more information on South Texas College of Law or any of the initiatives that you've talked about on this podcast, where could they go? They should just email me. The easiest way is just to email me at ctaylor at stcl.edu. Um, and I promise to respond quickly because I see this as an ongoing project that we're certainly going to be working on in 21, 22, but on for the next couple of years. And when we launch it full scale, I, no one will be prouder than I. Um, but I just can't say this enough. I really feel like all this happened because this school allowed me to teach and allowed me to teach a really brilliant student who went on to form a really excellent career. So it's a wonderful way that shows you how education can provide the background to someone who can go off and build a great career and then come back and provide back to her school, but also provide a pathway going forward to new people. If I could even build on that a little, uh, because of not only the sterling reputation of Natalia, but the colleagues and relationship she's developed, she was able to bring in people like myself and a wide variety of other practitioners who had no connection to South Texas College of Law. And, and now we're part of the family and we're going to be part of the family going forward. So uh, I really think it's it's even more impactful than you having a brilliant student who succeeded. It's having uh, an entire community support your efforts going forward as well. I think that is crucial. And, and this is entire program is centered upon that. Well, Dean Taylor, uh, thanks very much. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk about it and happy to talk about it with anyone that ever wants to talk with me about it. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. We got a new great podcast out on the Compliance Podcast Network called Effie Argentina. This is based upon a book by Greg Greenberg, who is my co-host for this new podcast. And we take a look at stories of exasperation in modern America. If you're exasperated, this is the podcast for you. Effing Argentina on the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you'll join me again next week for another episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.